today to our webinar titled Understanding and Conquering Imposter Syndrome for Leaders in HR that has been facilitated by HR Recruit, Marion Hewitt and Deborah Wilkes. My name is Jo Thompson and I'm a consultant for HR Recruit. I'm joined today by Marion and Deborah who will introduce us shortly. They're going to explore how to build the influence and esteem of HR leaders, professionals and the function itself, as well as sharing the results of their findings. If you do have any burning questions or comments during the session, then please put them into the chat box facility. But as there's a lot of content to go through, we will cover them at the end. I'm now going to hand you over to Marion and Deborah, who will introduce ourselves and start the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody that's prioritised this in uh, in what I'm sure is a busy day. Um, and yes, our title for this session, Confidence in HR and that's a pretty big topic for us to be trying to cover in 45 minutes and we've got a lot of top um, content we want to bring in. Um, we'll aim to finish around uh, quarter past, it may overrun a little bit so apologies if you do have to, to dash off, we'll, we'll do our best. Um, and we phrased it deliberately, you could argue it ambiguously because you can interpret that different ways and that's exactly what we've been trying to do we wanted to explore confidence in hr from multiple perspectives which we'll go into um as we go through so just um as we would like this to be really participative if you can um scan that qr code which will link you to mentimeter and if you put in that code um or it gives you you can scan or put in the code. If you um, want to use the code, you have to go to menti.com rather than Mentimeter. But I would suggest the quickest way is just to scan that QR code. And then we've got a couple of um, opportunities where we would like you to take part. So um, if you can do that, that would be great. So and if you haven't quite managed to do that yet, the uh, code will be up on up every time we ask you a question. Yeah. Actually, perhaps we could put it in the chat as well if we were clever enough. Um, so, sorry, that's, that's putting you on the spot, isn't it? Ask you to do that as you introduce I'll have ourselves. to go backwards to do that and get the code. <laughs> no worry. Um, <laughs> hopefully most of you got it. So would we just introduce ourselves uh, briefly? Uh, you may have met us before. We've been doing these uh, double act webinars for a few years now. Um, and both of us are strong you know, advocates for the people profession, um, having spent uh, quite a lot of years um, between us um, within different roles. And where we've worked really uh, well together is our perspective in terms of how we want to support the people profession um, just uh, differs. So um, my background, many years um, within HR in different um, sectors, different types of roles. And then over time, my interest has developed into more coaching um, and looking particularly sort of at the well-being and the positive psychology um, around how we can support our Ourselves, enable ourselves uh, to thrive and flourish, but doing it from an, an evidence base. Um, so that's where I come to this place or how the people within HR, how we can support and enable ourselves to really make an impact. So, Deborah, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Oh. Oh, you're, you're too keen. I'm too, yes. Uh, so, again, a lot of you will have um, heard my story before, but I was in HR for a long time, worked my way up from the bottom, ended up as head, H head of HR for a European HR function, first in the uh, IT sector and then in pharma. But then a few years ago, really re-engaged with my um, HR background because actually after I left HR I spent 20 or 25 years doing leadership development across all functions uh, but I started hearing from people that I met say at CIPD functions and realized that they were still facing the same challenges that I'd faced over 20 years before so myself and colleagues decided to uh, research that. What is it that organisations want from HR? So in terms of the, um, I won't go more into that, but let's get your thoughts in Menti. So this is an opportunity. I know a couple of you have put in chat about the code. So just to repeat, go into menti.com and then you get the screen that invites you to put the code in. 
And it's 44997374. So now is your first opportunity to use that. Yes. And what do you think? Yes. What do you think? Oh, God, words coming through. When you hear the word confidence, what it means to you. So obviously no right and wrong answers to this one because we're asking what it means to you individually. So we're deliberately hiding the words until we close it so that we, it's no uh, leading in terms of other people's thoughts. But the suggestion there's some commonality coming through. Okay, another couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are all anonymized, by the way, so we can't see who's saying. Oh, that. yes. Oh, that blue one in the middle is going to be important, isn't yes. it? Yes, I'm just wondering what that one is. Okay, let's have them. a look. Tell you what we've got. Oh, trust. Oh. Look at that. That's really interesting. Well, in terms of the other questions that we've asked. So trust, that's come through as quite a strong one. It would be interesting to dig down a bit more into um, what that actually means in terms of that's about how people are trusting you, um, whether you're viewed as trustworthy, all those elements. And there are oh, still more coming in, but knowledge, yeah. Um, strong, brave, strength, experience, competence, great words in here. Mm. Um, so yeah, defining confidence is always going to be difficult. And actually, you know, if, if I was putting a coaching hat on, one of the questions you would always ask is, so how will you know when you've got there? You know, what's happening different? What is different? What are you doing? What's happening? So these are the things that would help you measure, um, and understand where you'd got to in relation to confidence. So why, We'll reflect back on that um, later, and that will be really useful for the um, the next session uh, we're doing. Can't remember whether we mentioned that word already, but we because we got too much to pack into today, um, we're going to focus on the key bits today, and then we've already scheduled another session uh, for the tenth of December when we're going to go into greater detail of a, of a couple of elements that we've picked up. So why this research? Why did we decide that this was something that we wanted to explore further? And it was actually linked to a conversation we had from some previous research that had been carried out. And I had done research around uh, self-compassion within um, HR professionals, and I found themes there around levels, low levels of, of you know, high levels of self-doubt, to get the words the right order, um, impacting people. And then the results of the, of the work that uh, Deborah did from her research a couple of years later, she had five themes that came up. And we looked at those and we thought, yes, we know there's challenges in organisations. Yes, we know there can be issues with resource. And we're constantly into that conversation about how do you provide value, prove impact, all those sorts of things. But actually, we wanted to really challenge ourselves around that element of mindset. Because actually how, because the research put that at quite a low level. And actually, we wanted to really challenge how much was the mindset of those within the profession actually creating more of an impact and more of an obstacle than we were actually uh, recognising. So, you know, from a supportive perspective, we wanted to challenge that. Actually, sometimes perhaps it's more about us than we were potentially recognising. And if there was more we could be doing in terms of our mindset and then in terms of our actions to actually change the mindset of business leaders, you know, prove the value of what we were doing. So that kind of led um, to what we wanted to do. And thought, you know, imposter syndrome is something that people are talking about a lot, the confidence, the self-doubt. So we sort of brought it all together in terms of um, the questions we wanted to ask. And where we have worked in the last uh, few years is we have this model of reaching in and reaching out. So I'll cover the bits on the reaching in. And today that was around how we increase understanding of what might be holding us back and looking at how we develop strategies to move forward. All that's going to be largely in the next one. 
And then Deborah is looking at the reaching out elements, you know, how we build our increased impact through building those trusting relationships. So great that trust came up on that um, first slide that we had when we asked you, and then how we get the value across. And if we're doing both of those elements, we will be increasing our confidence and we will be increasing our impact, which is what as an individual and as a profession uh, we want to be uh, achieving. So then we came across this brilliantly timed piece of research, which Deborah, I'll pass over to you to um, elaborate on. Yeah, because you look at this as an HR person. So look at the statement, employers do not fully understand why employees are leaving. Well, I can hear you groaning because I'm sure that you've been telling the, the, the business leaders why employees are leaving. You've been telling them that managers need to value them. The organisation needs to show that it values them. Having a climate of being caring and trusting, potential for advancement, flexible work schedules. We know all these things are really important. And McKinsey in this data, there's the link there if you want to have a look at it. It just came out this week where they're saying that because the, the uh, title of the report is about performance management. And they're linking these reasons for leaving to the way performance is managed, which actually makes a lot of sense. So if you look at it from the performance management point of view, they're saying that companies that do focus on their people's performance are 4.2 times more likely to outperform their peers. That's an incredible statistic. 30% higher revenue growth and experiencing attrition five percentage points lower. So there's hard data there that shows that when companies invest in doing the things in that blue area on the graph, then you get business benefits. So for us as HR people, what it tells us is that leaders aren't listening. So there is a link between HR's confidence and getting leaders to listen. So if we go back to these three things that you'll remember, those of you that did the um, survey already, um, how HR is regarded by their organization. Now we've got to be clear here that we were, we're asking you your perception of how HR is regarded and your perception of how you feel, you regard your own function, and also how you see yourselves. And this graphic explains why we've researched those three areas. Because our belief, and I'm sure you will agree, and this is a human thing really, isn't it? I'm sure this would apply to anyone. If we don't feel confident doing our job, then it's very difficult for us to come across as credible and influential and impactful. And if that's the case, it's very difficult for us to promote the function. And it's not a very nice place to be. So if we can work on the confidence of HR professionals, then HR wins a hearing. So going back to that data that we just showed, we actually get leaders to listen when we say we need managers to manage performance in a way that enables the employee to feel valued. If we manage to get that point across, then we're able to leverage our capabilities. So say we decide then that managers need training on how to uh manage those conversations in such a way that the employee feels valued during that process, whether it's part of the formal process or whether it's part of all the informal check-ins that you hope they have regularly, then whatever you decide to encourage the organization to do will have more impact. So then leaders will they really hear then they get the impact and they learn we all know that half of our job in hr 
is helping leaders and managers to learn. And when they do, HR is respected, involved, and also they're aligned because during these conversations, we learn more about the business. And then when that happens, the organization benefits, HR can prove the benefits of the, to the organization. And as a result, it builds our confidence. So that's a really good virtuous circle that we can, we can create. So just going back to the survey, we had a really good mix of people that responded. So these are the options that we offered. I'm sure that within the manager group, we've got quite a lot of different role titles. We've got a nice lot of directors as well. So thank you to all of you who responded. It means that we can break the data down. And again, we, we can probably do that in our um, next session. And if you haven't already responded, please do, because we'll, we can then include you in the data that we share at the next session on the 10th of December. We do wanna hear from you all. And the, the things that come out of the free text can be so revealing. So I'll hand back to uh, Marion. So as we look at the internal perspective. Thank you. So what we're gonna look at is you know, understanding a bit about what actually imposter syndrome is, what we might pick up as signs and symptoms, and then strategies we might adopt. And then from that, we can have greater confidence, more higher self-esteem and be able to reach out to increase impact. So what is imposter syndrome? It's a phrase that is carried around a lot. And we were asking, um, oh, where are we going? So uh, well, um, I thought you were going to describe what imposter syndrome is. <laughs> so right. I can easily go back to the graphs. Go back to the graph, that's fine. Yeah. Oh, you want to go back now, right? Yeah, let's go back to the graphs. So this was um, the findings in terms of the question around confident in carrying out role. So um, you can see it by the, the categories and it is split by um, colours in terms of the, uh, the job level. Um, interested if anybody wants to um, put any comments into the slide, in any, any comments into the chat um, on the slides, whether it's what you'd expect. Um, and as with all data, it's interesting to really interrogate it in terms of, you know, you look at your first glance at it and then actually what does it mean uh, re um, in reality? So if somebody is rarely confident, then there's obviously significant confidence issues there, which, which um, is likely to be impacting them. So sometimes you would certainly hope people could build their confidence from that and often is a good place so you know we're not trying to make this all negative by any means you know half the people that responded often feel confident in carrying out their role and actually where you could argue that if somebody is always confident in carrying out their role are they actually stretching themselves because actually we only, if we move into a new area, if we're learning something, if we're challenging something, actually we're not likely to feel confident. So just thinking a bit more about what that means. I mean, it's also partly interpretation of questions. Um, you know, it may be they're confident to try new challenges, which is not the same necessarily feeling confident in the new skill, but just quite interesting. Um, yeah, some interesting comments. Yeah, standalone roles, whether that impacts people. And with the data, we deliberately didn't ask loads of different demographic questions in terms of gender, age, all that sort of thing, because it can start to get so complicated. And also it, it puts people off taking part if there are too many questions. So we wanted to keep to the basics, which was what we've done. Yeah. So then next one is experiencing feelings of imposter syndrome concerned I'm not as competent as people think so again okay, we've got a split there um whether that's in line with what you would have expected to see so yeah we've got people never and really 15% uh, experiencing imposter syndrome which is great but then we've also got 9% of people that are always feeling it, which is really not a comfortable place to be. And given that, you know, imposter syndrome is about self-doubt and, you know, lack of belief in probably what is a high level of competence, that's actually a sad place to be um, 
existing and operating from. So what actually is imposter syndrome? So it's a psychological phenomenon. It's where individuals will doubt their abilities and skills and achievements and will often attribute the success to luck rather than competence. And many really high profile and sort of indisputably successful people have talked about experiencing imposter syndrome. Uh, Cheryl Sandberg, uh, Serena Williams, she won one or two tennis matches. Um, Michelle Obama, Meryl Streep, you know, but they are saying that that's what they're feeling inside. Somebody's going to realise soon that they don't know what they're doing. And it's not just women. Um, other people, other, Tom Hanks has talked about it quite a, a lot. So, um recognizing that it does affect people. So what are the signs and symptoms? Because one of the things that we do know is there is a strong link between imposter syndrome and low self-confidence, which links to back to the cycle of that self-doubt that then perpetuates the cycle of imposter syndrome. So perfectionism, setting ridiculously high impossible standards um, for ourselves and then feeling disappointed when we don't achieve it. That Fear of failure linked to that perfectionism. We have that intense fear that any mistake or failure will um, show that we're you know, inadequate, don't know what we're doing, and we focus on errors rather than success. Tendency to discount achievements, you know, contribute, attribute it to external factors. Oh, it was luck, you know, right place at the right time, those sorts of things. And being uncomfortable with praise. And actually also the positive feedback can feed into that cycle of overworking because the good feel good feeling of praise doesn't last well long so just keep trying to keep it up overworking because people perceive that they're not good enough um, and they're going to be found out they work harder to compensate for that might not express their views which can lead to inauthenticity um, not sharing opinions saying what others what you think others want to hear and you know, seeking approval to reduce feelings of self-doubt. So those are recognised as um, signs of imposter syndrome. And there's been, you know, we, we've obviously doing our research, but there's been other research around imposter syndrome within the profession. Um, back in 22, um, HR Grapevine found that 60% of uh, HR professionals reported experiencing it at some point in their careers. HR director found 75% of female HR professionals experienced it, interestingly, compared to only 56% of male counterparts. And it used to be think it was much more women than men, but actually now it's one of those things that we're learning more about it. Um, it's actually often how it's interpreted, whereas women are likely to attribute failures to a lack of ability and men to insufficient effort. Um, so like more less about who they um, intrinsically are. Um, there's also where we see impact logically in the workplace of imposter syndrome that it, it's all right, stay back on the last one, <laughs> impedes um, career progression. And where would we specifically um, find it an issue within the people profession? And these were some things that we were thinking about, the multiple expectations. You know, we can be judging, juggling multiple world roles. We have to be strategic. We have to be um, an employee advocate. We have to be a compliance officer. We sometimes even have to be a counsellor. And actually how you meet all those different needs, juggle them and, you know, feeling inadequate if um, you don't manage to do those. And often they're actually the intention, the tension between them is impossible to, to meet all of them. The invisibility of achievements, you know, unlike sort of sales where you can have clear targets, often actually outcomes are much harder to prove. Um, you know, sometimes they're intangible. Yes, we can have some clearer things. We can look at engagement scores and turnover and stuff. But actually, a lot of what we're doing is very hard to really measure on, on a day-to-day -day basis. Lack of validation, um, particularly from other departments, and that can exacerbate feelings of um, inadequacy. And then workload. Anybody, I don't know anybody here is going to challenge me in terms of <laughs> workload being an issue. Um, I think I'm yet to do a session where workload, actually not just with HR, but with anybody where workload's not an issue. Um, but actually, um, and certainly CIPD research found that, you know, people professionals were reporting that excessive workloads was increasing to um, leading to increased stress and burnout and feelings of not 
um, coping. So what about the impact? I better get through this quicker, hadn't I? Well, we are going to run out of time. Performance and productivity, where people might be overcompensating because they feel they're not good enough, procrastinating because it's uncomfortable to be um, doing some tasks so we avoid it, underestimate abilities, impaired decision making, particularly if stress is high. That by you know, in, in terms of the actual brain, that impacts what we can, um, how we can um, make decisions, and we can miss opportunities. And with all of those clear links to anxiety and stress, burnout and depression. So we do need to be really mindful of the impact um, of it. It's not good for our health and it's not good for our performance. Mm. However, there are things that we can do. And this is going to be sort of the key part of, of, um, sort of the next session or one of the two key elements of the next session. So there's, there's not time to go through these um, in detail, but it just gives you a bit of a, um, a starter, if you like, in terms of thinking about strategies that we might be able to adopt. So acknowledge and normalize it. You know, the fact there's quite a few people here suggests that if you feel imposter syndrome, you're not the only one. So actually having open conversations, sharing thoughts with people is, is really helpful reframing negative thoughts, developing a growth mindset, um, work of Carol Dweck, the importance of, of recognizing that the knowledge, mind, uh, you, you can grow, it's not a fixed trait and embracing that. Uh, seeking feedback, focusing on continuous development and setting realistic expectations. You know, how many of you at the beginning of a day do a to-do list that you are never going to complete? You know, we set ourselves up for failure, which is not a good place to be. Rather than at the end of the day, you could write a list of the things you've actually achieved, because actually we do usually manage to achieve things, even if the list is still scarily long. Celebrate success. Look after wider well-being. And those that know me know I'm not likely to do anything that doesn't also include mentioning the importance of practicing self-compassion, being kinder to yourself, treating yourself with the same support and kindness as you would to somebody you cared about and mm. somebody that you valued. Because all of the research shows that when you are coming from that supportive place, all of the elements work better. Um, so the outcomes are so much better in terms of performance and health it's certainly not a soft and fluffy um, element of self-care so we don't want to make this we're not making this all negative we're def definitely not but so keen to take on challenges this is a great graph you know 40 percent are keen always want to take on new challenges and opportunities and actually what we want to be doing is feeling actually Yes, we want to take them, but actually feeling equipped, confident, um, overcoming that self-doubt that might, might be getting in the way. So we can actually get more people into that um, top column and then collectively the impact we make is greater. Mm -hmm. So we're reaching in for some elements and then obviously we're going to be reaching out to passing on to Deborah to pick up that bit. Mm. And when you think about that, uh, taking on new challenges, then that obviously helps your organisations to grow as well. So this is why we want to keep coming back to the fact that there is a business benefit for HR to build its confidence. We have to prove those links. And so that's kind of a theme with my uh, my three topics here is first of all identifying the right problem i'll explain what i mean by that using evidence and data we've got so much more now and consciously managing your reputation as one hr team because there's so much power in that coming across well together so in this question we asked uh, we asked you to again the frequency scale HR are recognized by the senior leadership team as key in delivering organizational success. And at first glance, you think, well, that's that's not bad because we've got, uh, what's that, 53 plus 13, that's what, 66%, that's two thirds feel good about that. So a third not so good. I'd rather see more people in the strongly agree, wouldn't you, to say, yes, of course they do. We're always at the table. I mean, there are signs and symptoms of how you might be measuring this. And of course, there are some people here who are saying, well, no, they absolutely do not recognise that we are key 
So we need to be able to evidence that. So there's a link there to my next point. And then we've got this. Uh, so if you just sort of quickly take a, an eye picture of these two back to the, they're quite similar, really. So the ability to focus on the right things is a key aspect of how we will be judged by our business stakeholders. Because they might say, well, yes, we know we need to um, focus on performance. We know we need to focus on DEI. But actually, you really want them to be saying, yes, HR are working on the things that help the business to be successful, which is like another question. And you could maybe ask them. We can come back to that in our next session. So allocating resources, again, it, the picture isn't quite so good. So it's like saying, OK, do they think we're important? That's one answer. Uh, do we focus on the right things? It's not quite so good. And then when we're asking ourselves, do we allocate resources to the right things? It gets a bit worse. So this is like more of a test of how good HR are at if you like putting your money where your mouth is, if it's really important to do something, you have to allocate resources to it. And there were a lot of people who said that workload is a real issue. And I know from talking to so many HR people that HR tech isn't yet terribly helpful in reducing workload. So there are some things to be done that there. And so... When we think about, OK, what are we going to do about that? How can we get the recognition from the business that we really do help them to succeed? Then one of the things that we can do. So I'm coming back to this point, identify the right business problem and then make impact on that problem. Because if you do that, you really consolidate relationships and that builds HR's reputation. So you've got a really nice virtual circle that you could overlay on the one earlier that's saying, well, if we're doing the right thing, we get great feedback and that's really good for our confidence and our reputation. So it's this question here that we start from identifying the right business problem. And I know from working with a lot of HR teams and in a way, it's part of our legacy that we know we tend to know what the right answer is. So we know that we should be doing great performance management because performance management, it, it, it should be done by every organization and it should be done well. We know that we should be doing, for example, leadership and manager development. We know that, that we should be doing, uh, we should have a grading structure, for example. But that's all coming from our perspective. And we're probably right. All organisations do need those things. But if we force them, as we do tend to do, and sometimes it's that we tend to want to do these things at a higher pace than the organization is ready to accept them and all the time they're thinking well okay I know intellectually that this is the right thing to do but how does it help me reach my deadlines how does it help me increase revenue how does this help me do my job and the things that keep me awake at night so one of the things that HR need to get better at is getting closer to the business. Because the worst thing for our confidence is people rejecting what we're trying to do, isn't it? And they're saying, oh, that's just an HR initiative, isn't it? And it's so frustrating. And we do have the opportunity to reframe things so that they can see how what we're doing in HR relates to their business problem. So again, there's a lot more that that uh, we could say about that. I could do a whole webinar on that, to be honest. So then 
the good news always in our surveys is that HR people do build good relationships. So when you're thinking about the line leaders and managers that you work with from day to day, then uh, the results improve. But here still we've got some sometimes. So that probably means that there are some stakeholders where you do feel proud and they may be the ones that you get on really well with and others where you don't feel so proud. And that might be the ones where actually the relationship isn't so great. So one thing that I have learned over the years is building the relationship is how we deliver results. And we lead through relationships. We manage through meetings. So if you feel that what you're, what happens in your role is that you're drawn into meetings all the time and those meetings have value and you've got lots of actions and everybody focuses on, have we done this? Have we done that? What do we need to do first? What are our priorities this week or this month? It's important to go outside those meetings to build relationships so that you can build greater trust. So that takes me back to the word cloud. When we've got trusting relationships with stakeholders, it's good for everything, isn't it? When you trust each other, it's comfortable for one thing. You go into meetings knowing that they're going to be nice. They're not going to be difficult. Because of that and the psychological safety that you have, you can say what you really think and they will tell you what really matters to them. So you're quite right to put trust right in the center of that word cloud. That was However, perfectly primed, wasn't it really? We couldn't have got a better outcome from that. We couldn't. Have got, <laughs> but it takes time to build trust, doesn't it? Yeah. It needs to be on your to-do list. You know, it's like, okay, build trust. How do I do that? Well, even if you haven't worked it out yet, put it on your to-do list. And you'll remember this arrow. I've talked about this a lot. And we actually asked you in the survey about this from two dimensions. One was from your own perspective. In which of the following zones do you spend your time? So just to go through these at the bottom here, we've got clearing up the mess after client groups manage people matters poorly. And it's interesting that there's not much differentiation between roles here because directors and CHROs still have to do this. It's just that the people involved are at a higher level. Then we've got catch up mode, responding well oper operationally but feel like you're always catching up. You're not quite on top of things. And then we've got involved early in executing HR activities that support the business strategy, but probably not influencing the business strategy. That's here out in front, involved in strategic decisions with people at the top of the agenda. And we asked you your perception of where leaders and managers think you are. And it was very, very similar. So there is broad agreement about where HR operates. And this has been consistent in all sorts of webinars and workshops and conversations where we've got a feel for this. And so the, the impact of this, of course, is that, well, you're not going to feel very confident, are you? You might be giving yourself a hard time and thinking, I should be doing better. I need to work faster. Hurry up, hurry up, do better. So there's probably some negative self-talk going on here. And also you're not able to clear your mind to think more creatively and objectively about what you could do if only you had more time. So coming back to this, when uh, when I was in my, my last HR role, actually, I put up with having too much work for far too long. 
And it was this classic thing of uh, I did manage. So I was a complete generalist, as I'm sure a lot of you are. And I managed to get a comp and Ben person as a specialist, a COE. And then when they re when I left, resigned, they replaced me with two people. And you kind of think, well, why didn't I put my hand up to say this job is too big for one person. It had grown. We were in 23 markets in Europe. It was a really complex job. We were growing. So I have to be honest and say I wasn't confident enough. And I have to be honest and say part of me loved it because I was in the middle of everything and involved in everything. But we have to get over that and delegate and take a really clear look at whether our role really works. And if it doesn't, what could be done? Because I think if I'd gone to my boss, although she was miles away in the US, and said, actually, we need to increase the size of the team, I think she would have said yes. But I didn't do it. But we can build a business case. And that business case might mean winning a hearing with business leaders and managers for whatever it is that you really care about. And winning a hearing is like the first step in this, this process, because then, as I said before, you're able to leverage your capabilities. So this is why we keep coming back to confidence and the confidence of the function. So again, I think I'm repeating what we showed earlier. We've got this other factor here of whether the leaders of the function are respected across the organisation. And there was some feedback in our earlier survey that there are some leaders in the function who aren't trying to get HR to the next level. And we do need to push them out of their comfort zone because it's difficult for their team to, to move forward if the leader hasn't really got that vision this new vision for what HR can do. So this is a, a great model, and I'll go into this in more depth in the next session. But you can develop measures, and we've got a, um, a platform so you can pull all these measures together because businesses know that results are driven by, by what customers actually do. Do they buy? Do they sell do they buy more do they tell others and they will do that if the right drivers are in prayer in place so if you think about your local supermarket what or, or your favorite supermarket you will be evaluating it all the time and something might happen that makes you go to another supermarket all of those drivers for customer behavior are driven by processes and it's the people that use those processes and they can use them well because there are the right conditions in place. And part of HR's challenge is that we tend to operate down this back end. But we can quantify the relationship between results and what we do in HR. And I'll go more into that in this next the next session. So as we round up, so when you think about your confidence and how you want to manage your, your reputation, what do you want to be known for? So again, we've opened this up on your mentee. And this time we've got uh, little phrases will come up. Nice point from Corinne. We can come back to that if um, we stay on after our formal time. Coming through, delivering results, yeah. Trusted partner. Adding value, driving business results, professionalism. It's quite a breadth, breadth of that. Some interesting. Yes. And, of course, it depends on your level. Mm. Because providing expertise uh, is something that we get satisfaction from. Mm. When we think about moving the function forward, there has to be more. Mm. 
there has to be more about how you, for example, coach and teach uh, your stakeholders to mm -hmm. really manage uh, how they are as a leader, how they are as a manager, mm -hmm. adding Thanks. value, mm -hmm. great results, creating a positive company culture. We've got great data now. We've got brilliant things mm -hmm. in here. Thanks, Supporting buddy. business yeah. success. Mm -hmm. Trusted, empathy and compassion, yeah. Intimacy. Yes. Yeah. And this thing about being caring and empathetic, I actually asked Dave Ulrich about this because um, we know we've got to be business-minded. And he agreed that HR has to be the function that people can come to when they want some caring. So we do have to do that as well. Thank you for all those. Well, we'll, we'll catch these and uh, you'll receive them. So this is... And to sum that up then, if you're clear about how you want to be seen, this is a great technique. Inside, just do a big circle on a piece of paper. Inside the circle, write the things you do want to be known for. And you can do this as a team. Outside the circle, take, uh, put the things you don't want to be known for. To put it in your conscious mind. And then you can work out what to do about it. And then working, at, you can do this at every level then. You can all come across in the same way consciously. And this is where the leadership of the function is so important. And whatever part of HR you're in, uh, there's a link in uh, at the end of um, the slides that you'll get. Uh, I did a webinar on this recently that was so well received about operating as one HR team. Because this is so important to our confidence, being in it together and supporting each other. And then this last point about your beliefs. If you believe that you add value, it will come across in your behaviour. If you believe that you're just a reactive function that clears up the mess, then that will come across in your behaviour. So working on our beliefs is really important. So you might like to reflect on that. I'm picking up on, uh, Marion, I'll pull you back in here. Yeah. Um, this question of whether you are in your comfort zone. Because we need to be, I'm sure most of you will have seen this in different um, iterations, but Comfort zone is called that because it's comfortable, it's safe, it gives all those things that make us feel okay. But actually, generally, we are not learning as much in there. We're not learning much at all because we've got the level of competence that we need for that. So actually, we need to move out. We need to challenge ourselves into areas. And that's okay. We have to... Um, be comfortable, get comfortable with that discomfort, because actually, as we get more into those areas, that comfort zone increases. The more something that if you think about, think back, something that was challenging when you first started is now in your comfort zone. And actually, what we want to do is continually increase that. And that goes right back to um, one of the earlier slides when, you know, I was questioning, actually, if we were never feeling challenged, then that would question whether we're actually making the impact we can because we're staying within our comfort. And if we've got that growth mindset, we always want to be pushing that boundaries. We always want to be learning more. But that's not the same as saying we don't know enough now or we're not competent now. There's a big difference between those two. So hopefully we've given you plenty of food for thought and yes. we've scratched the surface of what we actually really wanted to share in, in this session but um as much as anything we always want to provoke thinking um mm. and reflection and there were some comments in the chat we're not trying to pick up on, on all of them um but we'll reflect on them and um can pick up with people but yeah what has had impact on your thinking today so not alone thank you so that was kind of the first point on my one in terms of strategies yes um yeah the, yes deborah will like that second one relationships yes yeah. it is how we achieve results mm -hmm. yeah taking ownership and, and i think that's you know really it sometimes it can be uncomfortable sometimes we have to take 
greater ownership when I'm doing lots of sessions around well-being and you know sort of work-life balance and things actually sometimes we do have to take ownership for some changes um it's not always comfortable and I completely yeah. sympathize sometimes it's not us it's the business mindset mm. um and I do think it's in some organizations it is a real challenge yeah. to change the business mindset but we do have a lot of data now that will help us to do that because mm. you'll change their mindset by proving the impact on the bottom line. And mm. we can do that much better. Mm. And we'll talk about that in the next session. It's going to be a two hour session by the time we finish. <laughs> <laughs> so I think looking at the time, we better be wrapping it up, hadn't we? But Great. Oh, it's great. Oh. Loving it. Good. Like that. I'm lucky to work in the business I do but because you know sometimes you can choose with your feet if you're somewhere that where your um skills and talents aren't valued you don't have to stay there I don't know whether it's um, appropriate for me to say that so in the we've got the link please do if you haven't yet complete the survey we've got some events that Marion runs we've got some events and links to web webinar recordings that uh, we've got here and so do keep in touch, connect with us on LinkedIn uh, or and do email us if there's anything that you'd like to um, follow up on. And there's still time if you're interested in um, going into the draw for one of Deborah's books. Mm. Um, quite a few of you have put um, emails in there, but you can do it directly to us as panellists if you don't want to put your email into the main chat or, or you can email us afterwards um, when you've got the details. But yeah, thank Great. you. Hopefully we've given you lots of food for thought. Back to you, Jo. Thanks very much to Deborah and Marion. Um, loads and loads of information there. So as I've put in the chat box earlier, I will send out some correspondence to everyone that signed up to the event. And I'll put a post on LinkedIn. So if you want a copy of the slides and the recording, please put a comment against the LinkedIn post. Um, as we've discussed as well, Marion and Deborah are having a follow-up event, which is on the 10th of December. A link to sign up to that will be included in the email, um, as well as a link for the survey if you haven't already completed it. Um, HR Recruit's next event is on the 12th of November and is conducting effective investigations webinar, and a link to this is also in the email. If anyone's recruiting, we've also got accountants to recruit, FD recruit and exec recruit within the group. But otherwise, I'd just like to say a massive thanks to Deborah and Marion for your time and effort in putting everything together. I'm sure that everyone's found it really beneficial um, and look forward to seeing you on the 10th.